Joe Show with world-renowned author John Land. John, welcome back, John. Land. Welcome back, John. It's good to be here, Doctor Joe. It's terrific. So, so we've talked a little bit about about the process, you know, and, and the characters are are in. But how did you how did you find thriller novels as the people you're writing, the the people that are writing for you inside you, John? I, I lost that the beginning of that question. The, the thriller. Why the mm -hmm. thriller of of all things? There are so many genres. Well, I mean. You know, that's, that's, now I get it. Um, you can only write what you would read if someone else had written it. And I grew up, it started with, you know, television, you know, it, was, it started with the Twilight Zone, television shows like that. I've always been attracted to story. We talked about that um, in the last segment. But when I was really young, I'm talking about seven, eight, nine years old, my father took me to see the James Bond movies. Mm. And I was so enthralled by the Sean Connery James Bond movies. Dr. No, From Russia With Love, Goldfinger, Thunderball, You Only Live Twice. They made such an impression on me. And I really think that structure, if you look at what my books have always been, right from the first one I wrote, The Doomsday Spiral, published in 1983, um, and actually a senior thesis before that when I was at Brown University that didn't start out as a thriller, but it became one. Every one of my books, in some respect, follows the James Bond structure with those early Sean Connery movies. But you could say the same thing about the first movie I've ever seen, I ever saw, and that was the original 101 Dalmatians, which I must have been four or five years old. Mm. And I continue to say... That I think every book I've ever written is a retelling of 101 Dalmatians. Has there ever been a greater villain than Cruella de Vil? Has there ever been a more noble quest than rescuing all those puppies that were going to made it, be made into a coat for the villain, Cruella de Vil? Um, so I kind of think the early influences in my life in that respect um, made me very sensitive to pacing. I mean, I'm thinking of films I also saw when I was very young, like North by Northwest, you know, the classic Hitchcock film, sure. um, and others. So, you know, some of the James Bond ripoffs, the James Coburn Flint movies. Um, but now, would, would I have been this kind of writer if I hadn't been exposed to that format? Probably not. Because when you're impressionable, when you're really young, things stick. And, and they make a mold in, in, your, in your subconscious. Um, and when also growing up, I was a camper at Camp, at camp Samoset up in Maine and then a counselor. And I love nothing more, and this is the days, of course, in the 60s before the Internet, before we didn't have televisions in the bunks. So at night, counselors would tell stories. And when I became a counselor, I told stories. And you learn a couple things by doing that. You learn by telling stories out loud to an audience at a campfire. You know when you lose them because you can tell by the body language. Mm -hmm. You learn pacing. You learn how to, how to change the flow of the story to keep the audience enraptured by what you're doing so you don't lose their attention. Now, those stories normally took 15, 10 minutes, maybe 20 minutes to tell. Well, I try to be, I'm trying to do the same thing when I'm writing a thriller. It's still my voice, and I'm still trying to do the same thing. And the mark of a great thriller, and this is something I've only realized myself very recently, the mark of a great thriller, the mark of a great story of any kind, is that when you read it, it feels like it was written only for you. The relationship between the writer and the reader is very intimate. It's based on a promise. Because that, that reader has vested themselves in your book. They've paid for the book or they've taken it out of the library, whatever. They borrowed it from someone. Well, when they turn that page, they're believing that you're going to tell them a great story. Just like those kids around the campfire thought they were going to get when I started to tell them a story. I want my reading audience to get the same result, the same impression 
from my written stories that those kids around campfires used to get from my oral stories. Hmm. That's incredible. When you were talking about 101 Dalmatians, I thought that was spot on. I really do. Sorry, I couldn't resist that. Um, spot on? Yeah, got it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, dog. I was, I was hounding that the whole time. Thank you. But the thriller, I mean, how, how would you fit, you know, Arthur Conan Doyle and Sherlock Holmes into that? Is that a thriller or is that mystery, suspense? That is a great question, and it depends on the specific Sherlock Holmes book. Here's the difference between a mystery and a thriller. There are two. The mystery is about solving something that's already occurred. Mm. The thriller is about preventing something from happening that is about to occur. That is such a great it, distinction, John. And, That's fantastic. And the other distinction, and this is just as important, in the mystery, the hero's life is not necessarily in danger. Mm. In the thriller, the hero's life is always in danger. So the, so the, the hero, in saving the world or the country or whatever is also saving him or her self. Now, in the case of Sherlock Holmes, in many of his, the stories, when he's facing Mari, Moriarty um, or some of the other villains, his life is in danger. And it, I grew up in the Basil Rathbone movies, and just like Sean Connery is the only James Bond for me, Basil Rathbone is the only Sherlock Holmes. And I know there have been a lot of great actors Jeremy Brett and, and numerous others who played him very well. But there were many stories that Arthur Conan Doyle wrote where the stakes were very high. Uh, now, obviously, they weren't about Nazis like the movies were because Arthur Conan Doyle wrote these in the 19th century. Right. But there were a few where Holmes's life was in danger, where he was threatened. So in my mind, that makes some of those stories a thriller. I think, you know, we're splitting hairs a little bit. Is Lee, Ch is Lee Child's great Jack Reacher series, are they mysteries or thrillers? You know, um, but I, I would say in that case they are thrillers because Reacher is always trying to prevent something bad from happening that's going to hurt a lot of people. Or he's trying to rescue a lot of people from something bad that's already happening. The noble quest. And so with, with your character, though, um, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking about Sherlock Holmes and um, was it Reichenbach Falls where, where he and Moriarty, you know, throw themselves off the, the cliff and into the waterfall and Holmes is meant to be dead. And um, my recollection of it is that the public was outraged and said, you can't kill him. Yeah, he, Arthur Conan Doyle tried to kill Holmes a few that times. That is correct. He? Didn't right. he hate that and kind of... Especially the Queen. And it was the Queen who made, basically, said, you can't do this. You have to bring him back. And Arthur Conan Doyle really didn't want to write any more Sherlock Holmes stuff. Uh, you know, I, I've never reached that point with a character. Mm. Um, I always find that my characters are real to me. It's like killing your darlings. Killing, you know, I've never killed anyone, and I try, a lot of times I start my books intending to, that I'm going to kill a certain character, and then I get to like them so much I can't do it. <laughs> I get to know them, I can't do it. Um, you know, and I, you, I know that, so, so look, there, how do you generate suspense when, when you know it's a series and you know the hero is coming back? Right. You know the hero isn't in jeopardy, they're in, they're in danger. But they're on jeopardy of dying because they've got to come back for the next book. Mm. Well, how many times have you watched a movie like Failsafe? You know how it ends. But every time you watch it, in my, you're almost thinking, maybe this is the time New York survives. You know, maybe this is that time. So it's the story and the characters. But it's not necessarily wondering if the hero is going to survive. It's wondering how the hero is going to survive. And are the, is the world going to survive, or is, is the bomb going to go off? This goes back to what Hitchcock said. He said, suspense does not lie in blowing up a bomb and killing a lot of people. Suspense lies in putting the bomb under a chair in a movie theater right. while the audience is watching the movie. And now, this, now, you're, now that it's tick, 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 
It's not about the bomb going off. It's the anticipation of the bomb going off. That's what drives the suspense. That's what drives the story, the anticipation of what's going to happen next. And, of course, Mark is already smiling because we can anticipate exactly what's going to be happening next year. We're going to take a commercial break so that nobody's in suspense and that we can survive just as our sponsors do. So let's, let's take a commercial break, and we'll be back with the great author, John Land. Stretch the canvas, brush with madness, this is sadness, or just a show. 